Father, we thank you for this day. Praise your name for making us to see the dawn of another day. Lord, we know that as hours come, days pass by, weeks will roll by. And eventually, the years of our lives will be ended. Then we'll begin a new stage called eternity. The seal a long way afar. The seal will never reach the beginning of the eternal day. But as long as time continues and we become older and older, even if Jesus delays his coming, a moment 
will enter into eternity. And then, when all the things that have seemed important in time suddenly become insignificant, and the only thing that will matter will be what God thinks about us. Lord, we know that that time and that day is fast approaching. Some of our colleagues that we started the Christian race with have already passed on to eternity. We ourselves have, have followed the carcasses, the empty bodies without the spirit to the final home of the flesh. And their spirits have gone where well, we cannot recall them. As it has happened to some of our colleagues, men and women, so one day, we too will leave the land of struggle, the land of pride, the land of ambition. I will go to the land where every spirit or soul stands naked before the all-seeing eye of God. Lord, for us who are wise, it's that day we're thinking about. And we pray that you make us really wise to think, to meditate, to plan, to pray, to do everything that needs to be done that in eternity we will not regret. Speak to our hearts today. Make us wise. In Jesus' name I pray. This morning we are going to go through pages of scripture concerning a topic that should interest and should wake up every intelligent, thoughtful, planning person. And it's the subject of eternity and the fact that eternity is near. The Bible concept of eternity or the eternal refers to the endless past and the unending future. When we mention that word eternal, we mean everlasting, unending, ever continuing, without end. Or as the Bible puts it another way, forever. And for emphasis in other passages, forever and ever. But the mind only conceives of life terminating or ending here. To us, death is a real experience, we as human beings. But even then, we are often sluggish in understanding as to how near death might be. Looking at life in general and looking at Bible record, we find that we human beings have been deceived by the very nature of the human nature that we do not know many times how near death might be. In Numbers chapter 25, verses 6 to 9, death was nearer than the sinner's bed. A man and a woman were planning to live in sin to commit sin. 
all they could see ahead of them was their bed of pleasure ahead of them. And just before they reached that place of pleasure, death overtook them. And for many of us, for many people living on the face of the earth, even though eternity seems unreal and hard to be understood, and we are conscious of the fact that death ends the life here, but how many will realize that death could be nearer than the sinner's bed? In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 32 and 33, Agag was the least unprepared. According to the Bible record, he thought the pains of death are now passed over. And yet, death was so near, though man is unprepared. And though Agag was unprepared, death was real, nearer than he thought. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 10, together with chapter 18, verses 9 and 14. Absalom had been running for the throne, or running after the throne, and he thought the very next thing in front of him was getting to the throne to displace his father and to reign. And yet, death for him was nearer than the throne. And there are many people that when they look ahead into the future, the only thing they are preparing for is the throne of their own selfish personal ambition. But unknown to them, death could be nearer than the throne they are running after. They are prepared for the throne, which never will be. They are unprepared for death, which is nearer and more certain. In Judges chapter 4, verses 17 to 22, a man named Sisera was running away from the enemy. The enemy was pursuing him, and he outran the enemy. And he thought, the wider the gap between me and the enemy, the farther away death is. That's the way we are taught to think. That if I can outrun my enemy that I see, then the farther I run, the greater the distance between me and my enemy, the farther am I away from death. But this man did not know that death was nearer than the pursuing enemy. He had died before the enemy even caught him. And yet, the mind of man is sluggish. That we will not understand, neither will we think of how near death might be. The record in Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, verse 5, and verses 25 to 30, showed that death was nearer than the end of a pleasure feast. Belshazzar had called his lords and a lot of women so that he could have a feast, enjoy himself, and forget the God that his father or grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had feared because of the events that took place in Babylon during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. But Belshazzar had forgotten all that, shaking off every form of conviction, and he brought the vessels of the house of the Lord, that is, 
father or grandfather are taken from Jerusalem during the time they besieged Jerusalem. And while he was drinking, the hand wrote. Well, what the hand wrote, in short, when you paraphrase it, summarize it, just meant the end has come. Eternity is beginning. Wage found wanting. And before the end of that pleasure feast, Belshazzar had been ushered out of this world, out of the empire, out of the kingdom, to face the consequence of living a life without God. In 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 26 to 28, and verse 34, and verse 37, it was Ahab's turn to leave this world. But he least expected. And he told the people, and he said, See, hear what this prophet is saying, Micaiah. Put him in prison until I come back from the battle. And Micaiah said, If I see the visions of the Almighty, if I know what I've told you, if you come back from that battlefield, then I am not a prophet. He said, You see what he's saying? And he told Jehoshaphat, Let's go, my friend. We are coming back. And Ahab went to the battle. This even set his house in order. Didn't know that life was ending. We never know. We are dull. We are not sharp. We know that death is there. But even while death is just an hour away, we are dreaming it might be 40 years away. That's man. We are not trained. We are not intelligent, no matter who we are, to understand that death might be very near. And Ahab got to the battle, and somebody unknown drew a bow without any intention. Just what we say, accidental. But it wasn't accidental. It was in the timetable of God. And it struck Ahab. And Ahab said, I am wounded. He didn't know he was dying. He thought he was wounded. But he died. And death for him was nearer than he was willing to believe. That prophet told him and said, you are not coming back. If you are wise, get ready. All these lands of Israel that you see, which you and Jezebel have corrupted, you are getting out of it. That vineyard of Naboth that you took, you are getting out of the whole thing. And he said, see what is saying. I don't believe that. And the man said, you believe or you don't believe? Those who are living, who hear the story, will believe. You would have gone. Your faith or unbelief would not matter. Your answer to God. He had gone. In Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to verse 21, death was nearer than the dream of the schemer. This man was scheming, planning, very ambitious. I'll pull down my band. I'll build a greater. And I will tell myself, soul, take thine ease. And eat. Because now ahead of you, there will be years of pleasure. And Jesus himself said, that the voice will call and say, thou fool. This night will your soul be required out of you, out of your hand. And who shall all these things be that you have provided? For him, death was nearer than the realization of his dream. In Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 41, 
with Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. James and John had come to the Lord Jesus Christ, asking that one will be on this side and the other will be on this other side in your kingdom. They thought the kingdom of God should immediately come. They thought the Christ they were following will immediately set up his kingdom of a thousand years that they read about in Daniel. Because in the Old Testament, many of the passages are spoken about the coming of the Messiah and the establishment of the kingdom without leaving the space in between. And that time, because the disciples had not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit, a lot of the ideas and the thoughts they brought away with them when they were being converted, those ideas still remained with them. And so because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear and Christ will reign immediately. With them, there was no cross in between. The death of Jesus, they couldn't see that in between. And even the church age of years, they couldn't see that in between. So they began to have some thoughts. And he came to Jesus Christ and said, If one will sit here, the other will sit here. The other people were indignant. They were unhappy about it. But in Acts chapter 12, James was the first to die. Herod killed him. And the kingdom had not come yet. And so for James, death was nearer than the reign of the ambitious. Sometimes a man or a woman is ambitious, wants to run ahead of the will of God, has a plan, has an ambition, and he says, I have only one life. I want to live that life. I want to do this. I want to do this. My friend, if you are there, go slow. Let all these things we see in the Bible calm you down. The race is not for the sweet, but the appointed of God. When God appoints, that's the best. But for these two, as they were ambitious, wanting to reign, eventually death overtook them. Thank God James was a believer. He went to heaven, but the point is, death still came nearer than he suspected. In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, death was nearer than the expected honor of the deceitful. Ananias and Sapphira had wanted to have honor, prestige, glory, promotion, that didn't legitimately belong to them. They wanted to get it by deceit. They had sold the land and the property, and then they had divided the amount of the sale in two, and they had brought just a part to the apostles' feet. And Peter looked up at them and said, looked up at the man and said, Is this all? He said, Yes. In the previous chapter, the apostles had so named Barnabas, Joseph, as the son of consolation. Other people sold things and brought the money. But in the case of Barnabas, the apostles looked at him and they so much loved him, appreciated his sacrifice and commitment and consecration that they called him by a pet name. A name of affection. A name that you know, uh, you have a sense of belonging. When they refuse to call you by your normal name now, and all the apostles just, is that the son of consolation? Is that the son of consolation? And Ananias saw that and said, so it's only Barnabas that will have uh, this pet name, name of affection. And then schemed and planned with his wife. 
and they came, wanting to receive honor too by the siege. But death was nearer. Man doesn't understand that God sits on the throne of the universe watching everything that is going on. And he determines when eternity will start for each one. The wife was waiting back at home, maybe expecting the husband will come back. What's our new name now? What's our name of affection that gives us a deeper, richer sense of belonging in the early church? And didn't see the husband. She waited for about three hours. And then she rose up and said, maybe the people are so happy and they're joyful that they're just celebrating with that man over there. Let me go and see. And she got there and Peter said, come near him. Did you sell the land for so much? And she said, yes. The rest of the money was still at home. They never spent it. Death was nearer than the honor the deceitful were expecting. But the mind of man fails to understand, even with all these references and events in the Bible, yet man finds it hard to face reality. In John chapter 12, verses 4 to 6, Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 to 5, Acts chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, that's the record of Judas Iscariot. Death was nearer than the reward of the betrayer. He got the reward. Could he spend, could he spend it? No. Death is certain and eternity is real. And if death is near, eternity must be near. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, and we're reading verse 27, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. When death occurs on earth, eternity begins for each man or woman who has passed away from this earth. You can never cease to live. You will live forever, that is, eternally. The way to put it for you to understand is to say, eternity has no end. But because it's Difficult for human beings who are used to calculating in hours and weeks and months and years. Let's try to give some illustration that might help you to understand a little bit about eternity. And these illustrations are just to make the point clear. If it were possible, it is not, but if it were possible to tie a rope from earth to heaven, that is, the sky, and an ant were to go to the sun on that rope and return on that rope, you try to imagine in your mind how much time how many thousands of years it will take. When that ant has done that a hundred times, then a very small fraction of eternity has just passed away. Difficult to understand, yet that's eternity. Suppose a small boy were to empty an ocean. That's impossible. That's why it's impossible to understand eternity. But suppose it were possible for a small boy 
to empty an ocean with a cup if he could live long enough to do it. Think of the length of time, the years it will take him to finish that. If he could do that, after he has done that, that will only be a negligible part of eternity. Take this other one. If it were, if it were possible to gather all the books that had ever been written in all fields of human endeavor, and if it were possible for a student to read them one by one, the time he will spend in reading all the books in all the languages of the world will only amount to a minute fraction of eternity. Take another illustration. If a grain of, of sand represents one day, all the sand in all the seashores in the whole world will only represent a small, negligible part of eternity. Eternity is the lifetime of the never-dying God. And every man that lives in this world, after that man has died, eternity begins for him. The question is, where? For you and for me. The great thing for us to consider is that where will I spend eternity? Let's look at words from the Bible that show us some glimpses about eternity. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. Here, eternity is pictured in this language forever and ever. And also, it is given to be the lifetime of the never-dying God that sits on the throne. Because it says, they were praising him, referring to God, who lives eternally, who lives forever and ever. In Revelation chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, the angel which I saw stand on the, upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that, are, that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are the sea and the things that are therein that there should be time no longer again here forever and ever refers to the lifetime of the one who created heaven and earth and if you understand that god will never die and that once a man has been born into this world no matter who that one may be Whatever type of life he lives on earth, after death, he continues to live forever. And as long as God is alive, that person will still be alive. Wherever he is, on the one side or on the other side, every man that lives and then dies will live forever. That means if you can picture it, Adam is still alive somewhere. And that place is real. That means too that Elijah is still alive. The disciples didn't have any difficulty believing that because at the right time they paid a visit to the Lord Jesus Christ and they discussed with the Lord Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration about his departure from this world. But the terrifying thing is that Judas Iscariot is still alive too. And Jesus said it were better that you were not born. 
and it were better a millstone were hung on his neck, and he was sunk into the depths of the sea, if that could end life. But once somebody has been born, he lives forever. And the lifetime by which that man will live, that woman will live, will stretch into unending eternity. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and it shall reign forever and ever. Again telling us of the length of eternity. Revelation chapter 15 verse 7. One of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth God, who liveth God, who liveth forever and ever. What this explains is that the words forever and ever, many, many times, are applied to God. Then if you read other passages and the same words, forever and ever, are applied to man after death, then you understand that man will continue to live after he has died here. The words forever and ever refers to the duration of the existence of God of Christ. Greek experts and scholars tell us that actually the Greek words translated forever and ever mean unto the ages of the ages. An age is made up of years. And ages, years rolling upon years. And eternity is ages rolling upon ages. In endless succession, nothing could more plainly or graphically picture the absolute endlessness of eternity. Now that we know where or how time will eventually end and then we would have eternity for everyone. The question is, where do we go in eternity? In life, we know. When somebody says, I am going to a particular town, two people might say that we're in this particular place, but then they're on different sides. One is in the slum area. The other fellow is in the developed area. When we say we're going to eternity after we die, are we all going to be in the same place? The Bible says no. Let's look first of all at the future destiny of the disobedient. The unsaved, whose names are not written in the book of life. Understand that from this point on, everyone lives forever. The disobedient will live forever. The unsaved will live forever. But where they live forever is what we now want to check up from the scripture of truth. In Romans chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish, upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. In Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 
And whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here in the life we live, we often take pride in being religious. And we often feel that a man's religion will promote him in the sight of people. And that deceives us. A few times in the plane, when I mix with the public, sometimes somebody sits by my side and he talks, might even be talking about deeper life, and talk angrily about deeper life, and uh, might talk about religious people, might talk about leaders of churches, generally because um, there's nothing for me to defend, and I know that eternity is the goal. Whatever they say here doesn't matter. But eventually, after I have, I just nod my head if it says something true, I might keep quiet without showing any reaction, negative reaction, if it says something uh, untrue or bad. Eventually, after talking for about 20, 30 minutes, that's on his side, and I just either nod or just look at him quietly, he might then say, who are you? What's your name? And I might say, I'm Kumuyi of Deeper Life. And then he might say, oh, we all respect you. He might begin to say something good. But that's useless. It's an eternity that will determine true respect. But we religious priests, preachers, of whatever denomination, sometimes the government will put some honor upon us. Sometimes it's a book of who, who is who in the country that will put some value upon us. Sometimes it's the media that will feel, yes, even though we know that religious people, they have their problems, they are bad, but they have served this nation one way or the other. They might not have done enough, but they have tried. And therefore, they put some honor on those of us who are preaching. Or sometimes it's our own parents that will be proud of us and say, My son is the pastor of the Deep Life Church in a particular stage. And because of what they hear about Deeper Life or what they hear about another church, in the village, the parents might be proud of that individual and say, that's my son, that's my son. But it's eternity that will tell. All the honor we have from our fellow men, from women, from people, they amount to nothing. If you understand how short life is, and you understand how long eternity is, what you want is that your name will be in the book of life. But how many people have lost their names in the book of life? And they're still retaining the honor, religious honor that will place upon them. Because once the church starts calling somebody brother so-and-so, the church never stops calling that person brother so-and-so. Even when that brother has been known to have committed sin, gone back into the world maybe not even coming to church regularly and we know we're very conscious that this fellow has been living in sin unconsciously it's difficult for us after calling somebody brother so and so for 10 years to go back and begin to call him mr so and so his brother historically traditionally and religiously once we have started calling somebody sister so and so and that sister will divorce and go and marry another woman, another man rather, 
Now, it's difficult for us in the church to revert back to calling that woman Mrs. So-and-so. Well, say, do you know that Sister So-and-so has remarried? Still sister, though she has remarried. That's our concept. The human mind is dull concerning spiritual things. But the name is out of the book of life. But it is still Sister So-and-so. Did you see Brother So-and-so? His name in the newspaper that he was trading in cocaine yes I saw it I wondered for brother so-and-so he is still brother with the cocaine but the brothers and the sisters whether we're calling them by religious uh, habit we cannot break from and therefore they're still brother they're still sister after death, eternity will tell. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And when that happens, it's not just for a brief moment. I've told you already, everyone that lives in this world after death, eternity begins. In, in Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25 from verse 41 Then shall he say unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels verse 46 and these shall go into everlasting punishment the lake of fire is not a brief punishment. Short lived punishment. But they will go into everlasting punishment. But the question that many people ask is can the fire of the lake of fire be real? Can the fire of hell be real? Is it literal? From all the indications we have in the Bible, if it were only literal, if it were only like the fire we have here, it would have been better. It's worse than literal fire. Not terrible. The fire down here, has the ability to burn and burn any material up, given time. To so burn it up that you won't find anything again. The fire that the Bible talks about when it says um, the sinners, they go to eternal fire, the composition has the ability to keep burning and for the person to feel all the pain, all the pangs of real fire. And yet, the same, there's something in that fire that is also a preservative that preserves that person from burning up. You know, it's just like when you take, uh, you take ice or you put fish inside the ice. What's the ice to do? To keep it cold? Yes, but more than that. There's something that that ice does. It has the ability to keep it cold and also to preserve it from corruption. What you see about that ice here is what you see about that fire there. It has the ability to destroy, sorry, to cause pain, the ability to cause real terrible burning, and yet at the same time there's something in that fire that preserves the minutest cell in the body that's the resurrected body of the people that go into hell that's why it's more terrible in Matthew chapter 13 from verse 40 as therefore the tires are gathered and burnt in the fire so it will so shall it be in the end of the world 
Jesus had told a parable here. I said at the end of time, the tires will be gathered up and put into fire. That was a parable. Understand that in a parable, there are many things that are used. And in this parable, he used, one, the harvesters that will harvest. In the parable, those will be men or women. Then he said the tires, those will be plants, but unprofitable, unwanted plants. Then he spoke about wheat, that's food. Then he said they'll gather the wheat into the garner. Then they'll gather the chaff, or sorry, the tires, and burn them. And that burning with literal fire. But when explaining the parable, he interpreted and said, the tires represent this, the unbelievers. The wheat represent this, the believers. The harvesters represent this, the angels. The fire represents fire. No interpretation. If it were not real, when you interpret the tire, the wheat, and the people that gathered, and the investors, if the fire were not real, then you will interpret the fire, but no interpretation. The fire is fire. And in verse 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and he shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth another parable from verse 47 again the kingdom of heaven is like a net unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which when it was full they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels but cast the bad away so shall it be at the end of the world the angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. In Mark chapter 9 from verse 43 And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. For these to come out of the lips of Jesus Christ, you know, in life, it was difficult for Jesus to hurt anyone. He took a woman in adultery, in the very act. Jesus couldn't speak a bad word to her. That's not his nature. Neither do I condemn you. Woman, go and sin no more. They saw a man that had been born blind. And the disciples said, This man born blind, is it because of his sin? Or because of the sins of his parents? It was difficult for Jesus to say any bad thing. That wasn't his nature. And he just said, Neither his nor his parents sin. But that the work of God might be manifest on him, so have I come. And then he healed him. And all the things that took place in the various um, communities at the time of Jesus Christ, except when it comes to preaching repentance, he couldn't tell the people directly he was too kind, too loving, too gentle, too tender to do that meek and lowly how could such a person be talking about fire if fire was not real a person that was so kind will even tell simon simon you see this woman since i came to your house you did not give me water to wash my feet but since i came she has not stopped bathing my feet with her tears and wiping them away with her hair. 
Her sins that are many, they are forgiven. Jesus so tender, so loving. Having difficulty to even rebuke. Except his disciples when teaching them so that their faith will grow. And for that Jesus to talk about fire that never shall be quenched, it must be real. And so we need to inform and instruct and teach people so that they wouldn't say, you never told me. If you had told me, I would not have allowed myself to come to a place like this. Jesus said that the unbelieving, the unsaved, will be cast into fire that never shall be quenched. And verse 44 says, where they are warm, dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Where the cells of their body, the tissue, will not die, but they live forever. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter heart into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their one dies not, and the fire is not quenched. Something repeated the second time in a short uh, narrative. That must be important. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Luke chapter 16. Verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table moreover the dogs came and licked his sores because of our lack of understanding we have unwittingly made Unnecessary class distinction in the church. The Bible makes us to understand that there should be planning. If you read the Bible and study the Bible very much, you understand that the Bible is full of planning. Heaven is well planned. The world, the earth, was well planned by God. And everything that God had done and God himself had given uh, instruction to man to do. It's been well planned from the beginning to the end. You need to read uh, on your own later the book of Nehemiah. And to see that the work that Nehemiah did in the building of the fence around Jerusalem, the wall. The organization, the administration, the division of labor. The delegation, it was well done. And if you look at how Solomon built the temple, the years it took, you'll see that there was real organization in that. Sent to Hiram and said, Your servants are marvelous in cutting wood. Let them cut the wood. Then he had thousands of people that will carry the wood. Then he said, you'll be away from home for one month. Then for two months, you'll come back and stay at home. And then he said, these thousands will be in charge of cutting the stone. And by the time the temple was to be built, there was no hammer that was lifted up upon any stone. 
They chiseled everything far at the place. They were bringing the stones in. Everything just fitted in. That's organization. Because of that in the church, we have organized that there will be children workers reaching out to children. Not everybody can preach to children. We have also said there will be women leaders helping a women folk. Not every message a man preaches will reach deep to the heart of all women. Because of that, and because we need to reach out to those women, women outside and women inside the church, let there be women's section. We've also said that there will be campus outreach. Not everybody can speak to the doubting students. Those who doubt the authority of scripture, those who doubt the validity of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those who doubt the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they have a lot of ideas in their heads. They've read metaphysics. They've read about comparative religion. They have read about science. They have immersed themselves in the down theory of evolution. And because of that, doubts fill their minds. But we have Christians who have been students themselves. And who have read themselves. And who can reach out to those students. Because of that we have campus outreach. The adolescents that are going to secondary school. Because of the restlessness. The instability. And the waking up to life of adolescents. In secondary schools. It takes a person that understands. The life and the mind of children. Working. To be able to reach out to those students. And tell the students. This is what Christianity means and relate the Christian faith to the lives of these children. And so we have the people that are reaching out to them. The same thing we have the uh, International Friendship League. It only happens that they are rich, but that just means that that's a class. The students are a class. Secondary school uh, pupils, they are a class. The women, they are a class who are reaching to specially. And all these various sections were reaching out to them specially. But the only one that has given trouble to the carnal mind is the IFL. We don't, understand, we don't misunderstand reaching out to the campus people. We tell them the truth, the whole truth. We don't misunderstand telling the truth or preaching the gospel to secondary school children. We tell them the whole truth. To the women, we tell them the whole truth. The only problem with the carnal mind of the preacher is with the IFL. We cannot tell them the truth. They are IFL. But what makes the difference? They will live forever after they have died. And here Jesus Christ told the story about the rich man, the IFL member, who did not consider God. Maybe they were invited to meetings, but the preachers were too carnal. To tell them the truth. Because they are rich men. We are after their souls. We are not after their money. If you are after their money. They become your God. But we have made all these sections. All these divisions. All this administration. In evangelism. So as to be able to reach out effectively to them. And so let us understand. That if the mind is not carnal. If we are spiritual. You will not uh, feel that because that's IFL, you will not tell the truth. If you are not going to tell them the truth, don't bother them. Let them remain in their sin. Don't have any program for them. Let them remain where they are and go where they will go when they die. But if there is any program for them, if there is any outreach to them, just like we have outreach to this section, that section, that section, Make the outreach what the Bible wants it to be. And so this man, in purple and fine linen, feared sumptuously every day. And there was this beggar, Lazarus. If you have noticed Jesus Christ, he never gave the name of anyone in a parable. A king made a feast at the marriage of his son. The people were nameless, unidentified. That's a parable. 
The kingdom of God is likened to a fisherman throwing the net into the sea. No name. That's a parable. The kingdom of God is like a person that has gathered the harvest with all these people. And then the tires is thrown into the fire. Who is throwing it into the fire? You don't need the name. It's a parable. When you look at all the parables, no name. But when telling this story, there's no parable. There was a certain rich man which was closed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And you will discover if you read commentaries all commentaries that are of any value they give the same name to that rich man because they knew where the story was brought out and if you have been studying and reading you'll know that all those commentaries now when we talk about commentaries commentaries of value Commentaries of value are not just commentaries that somebody sat down somewhere and began to think and began to, uh, to write. Those uh, people, they spent years studying before writing. And they will study the Greek language and the Greek thought and the Greek classics and all the writings of those days. And all those comment, uh, commentators generally are uh, real historians. They would have read the history from Josephus, from Jerome, from all the people in the early church before they ever start to put their ideas down and interpreting the word. They are people that have really gone into the study of scriptures, of languages, of the poets, of the classics of their day and of the days of Bible time. So that's how they would know where the story was coming from. But let's continue this. It says he was desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and lived his stores. It came to pass that the beggar died. It only seems far away. Death will come. That's the time John Wesley was very young and he ran about and ran about and preached. One day he died. Surians tell us that from the age of 20, Spurgeon had been very active in preaching. And even by the age of 20, he would have been preaching to thousands of people before he got married. And there are some, of, some interesting stories about Sitch Spurgeon. But as young as he was then, one day he died. Charles G. Finney was a young lawyer and very active and very full of energy and very sharp, logical in mind, and his messages were, they showed that he had been a lawyer. And he was, uh, he could preach, go here, go there, go there, but one day he died. We seem young now, and when young people look at themselves, they think they'll never be old. Because of our lack of understanding, we think that we'll ever be like this, but one day, you will not be here, I will not be here. And so it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. They will die. The rich man also died. The Kadnezar rose up and looked at his kingdom and he said, Isn't this what I built by my power? The man has now died. Pharaoh said, Moses, let the people do their work. Because I know that not that God that you are talking about. We mean business here. All we want is let them work. Ye are idle. Ye are idle. That man has died now. Herod closed and in his royal regalia and he spoke to the people and he said this is the voice of a god highly respected he has died now 
In the days of Shakespeare, great, great writer. Well, Shakespeare is gone now. Napoleon Hill was a great writer. Writers on the psychological area on how to be successful, how to think and go rich. But he is dead also. And all these people, either of the world or in the church, that might have made an impact in their generation, either on one side or the other, positive or negative, they have all died now. Why don't we think? Why are we living as if this life is too long? It's too short. By the time you become old and by the time you are leaving this place, you'll be wondering how life has been so short. Sometimes you put everything you have done all together in a little basket. And you wonder, is, it, is this all I did all through life? Life is too short. There's no time for carelessness or play. The point is that the rich man also died and he was buried, really buried, really buried. People question us, don't you bury people in deeper life? <laughs> what does it matter to the dead? Whether we bury them or we don't bury them. They don't recognize that honor. You are paying the last honor, if that is honor at all. What do you care for that? If a man is sent to the prison, and while he's in the prison, the people came to celebrate and come to rejoice in his house because he published a book last week, although he's not going to spend the rest of his life in prison. While he entered into the prison, the very first week of imprisonment, they are celebrating that he wrote a good book when he was still in the free world. What does that do to the man in the prison? The man is gone. After a man has died, and gone to hell and we say that we are burying him that's all right for you who are living he doesn't care for it he doesn't understand and he was buried and how many people even so-called christians would say if that is how they bury people in that church then i cannot go to that church ah, how can a zona leader died a coordinator died no announcement. They just buried that person like ordinary person. How do they bury ordinary person? How do they bury extraordinary person? It's only canal minds that worry about all that. But they buried him. If that's what you want, there are the people that will bury you. Let me go back to my people so that when I die, they will bury me. Good luck. I had, we had a worker in Lagos here. I don't know whether he's still a worker. In his section, he was reported that he doesn't come to the church at the end of the month. He'll go to the town's meeting. And the leader of that section spoke to him much, but he will not yield. And the leader felt that if we can take him to the GS superintendent, obviously, if we spend some little time together with the GS, he will understand, he will change. And the man came to see me. I said, This town's meeting, the church does not permit it, the church does not allow it. All the purposes of the town's meeting is not biblical to the church. And therefore, leave them stay in the church he had difficulty he couldn't you know part of the reason he's living in lagos if he dies and he's not going to that the town's meeting all those people they are not going to follow the dead body back to the village he didn't say that but i know that's one of the reasons because people have been dying and they, those people have been saying, oh, he wasn't in the town's meeting when he was alive. He was only in the church. Let the church bury him. Don't worry about how they will bury you. After you have gone, you have gone. If we bury you in Lagos, that doesn't change where you have gone. If we carry you back to your village, that doesn't change where you have gone. But how can I just die and only two people from the zone will follow me to the village? They are not following you. They are following dead bodies. 
whether two people follow you or 20 people, is to human beings that these things matter. All these things, they don't matter to the spiritual man. They put the person in mortuary for three months. They're still making publicity that so-and-so died, so-and-so died, so-and-so died. We're still sending to America, sending to Britain, sending overseas. We're also sending to all the international friends that knew that man before so-and-so died. Let them come to Nigeria and bury that person as man. But all the time that the body is in the mortuary, the spirit is somewhere. That's the thing that counts. So why do we fight on church organization? That our church, let us add this barrier. Other churches, they are making fun of us. They bury them in the Catholic church. They bury them in the Anglican church. They bury them in the Methodist church. Let us also bury people. Let's give them eternal life. Whatever happens to their dead body after they are dead, let's make sure they get to heaven. That's what counts. And some of our parents, they are challenging. That's why some of them, they don't want to come to deeper life. They say, well, I don't understand my son. I don't understand my daughter. If I die now, I don't know whether he will bury me or not. Death, there's something beyond death more than the burial. And so, the rich man died and he was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried. Do rich men cry? Here in the world, they only sing, they only rejoice, they only dress, they only brag, they only boast, they only manifest authority. And the rich man cried. That's crying. That's weeping. And said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Do they beg for mercy? Do they ever beg for help? Have mercy on me. And send Lazarus. Lazarus, does I ever need the help of anybody in the illiterate class? Does I ever need the help of an usher who doesn't even know how to dress? Does I ever need the fellowship of the church of poor people? The rich man said, Now I need Lazarus. I never needed him. If he, le if he led house fellowship, I would never have attended. If he witnessed to me, I would never have accepted. But now I need him. Send him to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue and because I'm tormented in this flame that fire is real but Abraham said son remember that thou in that lifetime received thy good things likewise Lazarus evil things now he is comforted and thou art tormented beside all this between us and you between us and you. Here we have loved one another. And you have felt we will never be separated. Yet, between us and you. That separation will come. Might cover your sin up down here. And look at you as if, well, you're so important to the church. How can we ever separate from you? Brother, you're not living right. But we love you so much, we never want you to be separated from us. Have a change. But you remain adamant. We'll call you again. You know that maybe in your local church, you are too important to them. And that uh, the whole church, they say, we know that our pastor is not living right. But if the discipline that pastor or the take away that pastor will break the church, maybe because of that, we'll leave you there. We can't deal with you. We can't separate you. But one day is coming. The one who can separate. The one who can divide. He will. And God says, I work 
and who can hinder me? Between us and you is there is a great God fixed so that they which pass which would pass from hence to you cannot neither they neither can they pass to us that will come from thence my question to you is where will you spend eternity i can only decide for myself you can only decide for yourself but when you die you live forever the righteous will live with God in heaven forever. The unrighteous, the unsaved, those who die in a backsliding condition, they will go to hellfire forever. They never leave that place. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and it shall, it shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast, and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Where will you be when the trumpet sounds, or when death comes, and the people here have thought you've gone to a good place? In the real sense, where will you be? The impartial God, who will never miss any detail of what has happened in your life, he will decide. What decision will he take about you? Rise up and pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you this morning because you have declared to us that beyond activities, the life we live before you is what will count. And Lord, I pray that the reputation that we hold before you will not be offices, but Lord, the grace of God in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, many times we forget that eternity is near. And we know, like we have seen today from Scripture and history of people around us, that they have lived and they have died. Lord, I pray that at our own time, may it be at the time our hearts are right with you in Jesus' name. Help us, O oh God, that we'll never be careless, but as we have started well with you, that we'll end well with you in Jesus' name. When Judas ended up, all his years of carrying the bags was forgotten. Lord Ananias, the part of the money they brought to the church was forgotten. Lord, I am praying that you help us in such a way that when we will end up here, Lord, the only thing we'll have on record will not be the few years we spent jumping here and there, but that eternity we'll spend with you in Jesus' name. Let this be a mirror every morning when we wake up. Let this be a mirror in the evening before we go on bed, that we want to spend eternity with you. May it be so, O oh God, in Jesus' name. This is the joy and sum total of the Christian life. And I pray God it will be so for every one of us in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our general superintendent. And we are asking that as you have started wonderfully well with us again this morning, may your anointing continue in his life in Jesus' name. More things are in store for us. Use him, Lord, to deliver them to